All right. So hello, everyone. Welcome to Open Hour. I'm really excited uh, to share this Open Hour with everyone today. And I'm especially excited because um, I don't know if anyone saw as well, but Open Hour is now three years old. Woo! <laughs> so <laughs> we're, we're actually we're going back to the first Open Hour topic, um, which um, I think some of you were on, and it's been so cool over the past three years because not only has Open Hour been um, awesome for the people who come and join, but it's been it's created this really great archive for people to come and learn later and check back in on things that have been going on and other people have been exploring around the world. Um, so to sort of get back to that, I wanted to chat and um, revisit the aerial mapping projects and what's been going on um, since we talked about this last and where we're excited to move forward. And um, I'd love to, if I can put you on the, on the spot, Bronwyn, to give a little context and then maybe we'll pass around and do a quick intros with where, um, who we are and where we're calling in from. Yeah, um, so we've been, uh, you know, we're three years into the, the open hour and the aerial mapping projects have been a real cornerstone of the stuff that Public Lab does. Um, and so we're, we're at the point where we've been seeing a lot of projects evolve over the years. We're seeing new people kind of coming into the community, which is really exciting. And so right now we're also running this Kickstarter where we're exploring um, ways to make some of our kits a little bit more more portable, more accessible, a little bit uh, easier for, for first timers to kind of jump in and start using. Um, so we're, we're, we're thinking a lot about, um, you know, ways that, that we kind of keep rethinking and keep developing um, the, the tools that we have and that we offer. So, um, so yeah, and let me see, I'm going to just do a really quick, um, <laughs> I, I like the cuckoo clock, whoever brought, whoever brought right, it. Sorry about that. <laughs> I really liked it. Um, Three years, but course, I think that, that was, was the first. Of course, that was Jesse. That was Jesse, right? So, <laughs> um, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and share share a screen, the, my screen just for a real quick little overview. But um, <clears throat> all right. So, can you guys all see see this? What I'm showing now? Not yet. Oh. <clears throat> uh, so the green button on the bottom is screen share. Yeah, let me see. I thought I hit that. But. And then I think you have the option to which one we view. Oh, I see. I see. Yep. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing recent? No, you're not. Gotcha. I see it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I'll do it. We're seeing exactly what you're seeing, I think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like one of those options, right, where we actually see your full computer. <laughs> Are you looking at the, the grassroots mapping guide now, or? Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. we are. Yeah, so, yeah. so um, you know, we, we've sort of been, um, you know, public lab as, as an entity, everybody's been kind of working together to sort of use and fine tune a lot of the aerial mapping tools. Um, so, you know, we've, the, the, the kit's kind of grown, um, this is sort of an earlier, an earlier picture of, sort of our, our complete kit, um, which is sort of a little, a little, maybe, clunky around or rough around the edges compared to sort of the things that people are using now. Um, but, uh, you know, things, things sort of have grown out of sort of simple accessible solutions to kind of how you get a camera up in the air and get it to sort of take some pictures. So a lot of the rigs that people use to attach um, cameras to kites are sort of based on the easily obtained materials. We've got, we've got sort of bottles and rubber bands and things that are just kind of swinging around. Um, um, in the air uh, to kind of things that have been modified and adjusted and sort of fine-tuned for everybody's projects wherever they are and whatever whatever they're using so people are kind of gravitate to different cameras they gravitate to different kinds of rigs um, they figure out what's working for them and then they share all of that with our community um, so what we're looking at now this this little screen here is you know sort of the pieces of one of one of the the mini kits with sort of if you look at this little um, 
the little 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 black thing sort of in the, the lower lower left that's um, got smaller cameras, smaller kites, um, sort of different possibilities for you know quick lightweight uh, tools that people can can use um, and that's sort of what's going out in the, the Kickstarter now um, and sort of wonderful wonderful fun squid kites um, just to try and get get people out there um, playing playing with stuff so um so so yeah so what what we're kind of interested in um i don't know we're interested in talking about tonight is just a little bit about sort of where people are with their projects um i would be especially interested from the people who are talking to hear a little bit about um <laughs> the uh the the rigs that they've been working with sort of the the troubleshooting that they've done with their with their setups and their equipment and um also just you know in addition to maybe talking a little bit about their projects uh you know for for folks that are new to public lab or to, to mapping um you know, I just feel love to talk a little bit also about how those projects and the work that, that people have been doing um, relate to the community at large. So how people kind of bounce off of the public lab platform to get the stuff that they're doing done. Um, so yeah, and so without, without further ado, I think I'm gonna kind of wrap, wrap this part uh, up so that we can talk to, talk to everybody. Great, thank you. Um, so let's um, let's go around and say um, who we are and where we're calling in from. And then if you have something particularly interesting that you want to share or you want to ask, um, feel free to throw that in as well, and then we'll build that into the rest of the conversation. Um, but let's let's start at the. I'm going to start at the top left hand corner of my screen and call on you, um, Gilbert, if you want to say who you are or your name and where you're calling in from, and if there's anything particularly pressing or interesting that you want to chat with people on the call about. Okay, I'm uh, Gilbert Roshan, and as of uh, three and a half weeks ago, I joined the staff of Public Lab as the official title of uh, Advocacy Manager. So I'm calling from New Orleans, and uh, actually, uh, as we discussed before we got on board, I, I came from um, the Purdue Terrestrial Observatory, primarily using remote sensing as a uh, tool, and uh, recently completed a project for NATO to establish real-time remote sensing ground stations at partnering universities in Morocco for early warning of disasters. And uh, we're currently working under a National Academy of Sciences grant to uh, extend um, uh, capabilities to communities in New Orleans, Biloxi, Mobile, and Pensacola with respect to monitoring. And DB, you'll be delighted to hear that uh, after, uh, on my way home, I had to pull over to the side because I've got two phone calls for, uh, to discuss uh, collaboration with uh, the director and the vice president uh, of, um, of the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice, which uh, has a grant from the Kellogg Foundation to be interested in collaborating with us on the National Academy of Sciences projects and on. Great, excellent. Finally. Um, okay, so I'm, I think I'm second on my top row here. Um, so I'm Stevie, I'm also um, in New Orleans. And um, I, one of the things, if people are interested in chatting, um, I'm thinking a little bit more of I mean, we, we've done a lot of like wetlands mapping here, um, but one of the things I'm actually kind of becoming more interested in is um, um, using balloons and kites to map more city infrastructure. Um, so thinking more about like cities and what it's like to map in a city. Um, so if other people are interested in that topic, I kind of kind of like that one right now. It's sort of pressing for some of the things we have going on here. Um, Ayman, you're next in my lineup if you want to go. I'm in, uh, from Brooklyn, Gowanus. I work with the Gowanus Canal Conservancy and I'm one of our local advocacy groups, water quality uh, targets called the Gowanus Strangers Canoe. Doing a lot of mapping uh, of urban streams that are buried underground for a project called CSI, New York CSI, uh, which is a uh, creek scene investigation. And so we use the high resolution aerial photography to look for clues in the landscape such as weed patterns, changes in color and asphalt, patterns of puddles, 
to give us historical clues to where old stream beds are that might be uh, suitable for restoration. And now we have stumbled across uh, all, a couple of military battlefield sites directly next to those streams. And uh, one of them happens to be on a site which was recently purchased by the White House um, advisor called Jared Kushner. And so we are now researching the site as an American battlefield site. Uh, and the project's gonna be called Make Juana's Great Again. And that's uh, the purpose of it is that <laughs> site declared in that park. Thank you, Ivan. Um, With you said that. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse, are you available? Yeah. Uh, so I'm Jesse Breen. I am a cartographer in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, my use of the aerial mapping kit has mostly been to teach students in GIS classes and digital mapping courses about how to actually collect their own data. So in collecting your own data, you actually understand package data better. So we use it as a teaching tool. Awesome. All right, Justin, hello, are you available to unmute? Hey everybody, I'm Justin Schell. I'm calling in from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, I run the Shapiro Design Lab, which is in the University of Michigan Library. And I actually went to high school with Shannon Dosmegan, like we reconnected for 20 years, which is hilarious. <laughs> um, but we are building a citizen science, community science program within the design lab. And um, so I'm eagerly waiting uh, my balloon kit to, to come in the mail and, uh, and here to hear how people have used it and just uh, learn whatever I can. Great, thanks. Um, I'm going to pass it to the, the other New York squad there. This seems a few of you. Yeah, the, there's, there's actually more than a few computer. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll pass the computer on. Um, I'm, I'm Bronwyn. I'm, uh, I'm a public lab staff, so I'm an open hardware community manager. Um, but I've sort of been involved in public lab over the years, um, sort of pitching in on various projects over over here everywhere so um so yeah um, and we'll keep this moving because there's a bunch of us all right hold on. <laughs> I, you know, yeah. okay. my name is daniel i'm an interested uh, spectator in this in the mapping project for the interest of um emergency response volunteer emergency response uh i sort of put this project on the back burner a couple of years ago but now i got the invite from liz regarding that you're having the open hour I wanted to see what is new in mapping for the possibilities of use uh, for emergency first responders. Very cool. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, I'm Scott Eustace. I'm actually from New Orleans in New York, from one island uh, to the next that uh, <laughs> you're visiting. And uh, down on the Gulf Coast, uh, I work with Gulf Restoration Network that monitors uh, mostly uh, industrial facilities um, in the wake of a lot of the coastal flooding that we have uh, as part of the Gulf Monitoring Consortium and uh, kite mapping for years and uh, where I, I think I have it down where I, just, I always like carry the little camera always ready to go because <laughs> uh, especially down the Gulf Coast with these facilities you never know when you're going to get up in the air so hey greetings Oh, hey. <laughs> I'm April Joyner. I'm a tech journalist, and I'm just here to learn more. Um, hey, I'm Liz. I'm super staff here at Public Lab, and uh, on this hot summer Brooklyn day, I'm remembering our January 2010 Arctic mapping with Imond. Uh, <laughs> we canoed through ice on the Gowanus. Um, just want to share that memory, because it's really hot right now. <laughs> All right. That's all I'm here. Oh wait, I'm here. <laughs> oh, New York. <laughs> Queens in the house. I don't know how to make myself appear. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Laura Chipley. Uh, I'm a multimedia artist and a filmmaker, and I've experimented a little bit with kite mapping here locally in New York City, with the help of Ivan and Liz, actually. Um, but I'm working on a project in West Virginia in the coal fields. Um, working with activists to use drones to use, uh, to photograph and sort of help the community understand the scope and proximity of energy extraction operations uh, in central Appalachia. Great, thank you. Do we have any other stealth New Yorkers on? Okay. 
<laughs> All right, Jeff, sitting on the dock of a canal. Um, hey, I'm Jeff. Uh, I'm part of the public lab staff as well, and <clears throat> been uh, balloon and kite mapping for a while. And um, I, uh, uh, I've been really uh, involved in the the Kickstarter that we've been running, and uh, one of the things on my to do list recently has been to work on the the poster design to um, help people teach each other how to balloon map uh, by putting uh, the instructions up on their wall. So that's something I've been working on right here on the dock. I'm in Providence right now, but I live in Somerville, Mass. Great, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna butcher this name. And Pritzer, Pritzer. <laughs> that would be me, and that would be the username that Zoom gave me. But um, hello, everyone. I'm calling from Urbana-Champaign. I introduced myself this morning on the grassroots mapping listserv, but I'm a doctoral candidate at the University of Illinois. I'm in the Institute of Communications Research. I'm currently working on a dissertation project that focuses on the evolution of um, tactical geospatial media and the kinds of communities that have forged around them, public lab obviously being a great example of that. So I have no background in kite mapping whatsoever, but I'm looking to get involved back to the Kickstarter and be eager to hear more about it. Excellent. Thanks. Um, Mitchell? Did I say your name right? Sorry. Oh, is it me? Yes. Okay. okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, no it's spelled the weird way. Um, hi, I'm Michael Magurski. Uh, my most recent involvement with public labs, I think, was mapping Lake Merritt in Oakland in 2011 with uh, Stuart Long and some other folks. So it's been a little while since I've been involved. Um, but in the meantime, I've been part of an organization that's relevant here uh, called Green Info Network with Gregor McLennan and Emily Jacoby. We're doing a lot of drone and other aerial imagery in South America, um, specifically in Peru, uh, Guyana, and Ecuador. Um, and currently I'm working as a product designer at a company called Remix that focuses on urban design, transportation, transit, other similar things. And there's some aerial imagery stuff that may or may not be interesting. So I figured I'd put my head in and see what's going on. Great, great. And it is free and I see you have an adorable kitten. I've seen it. <laughs> Sorry, uh, this is like the kitten that arrived at our house last yesterday. So yeah. He's super cute. Um, so I'm an AS3. I am a professor in geography at the University of Wisconsin. So I'm in, in uh, Menominee, Wisconsin. Oh, yeah. hey, cool. Hi. Yeah, so this summer I have two students who are working on an NSF um, funded REU project, which is like a research experience for undergraduates. And we're supposed to be investigating uh, phosphorus in our Oops, I think you, um, you just, Your you went right. muted. Hold on, let me unmute you. <laughs> there you go. It's a kitten. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're looking into phosphorus pollution in our watershed, and we're um, trying to map out land use and um, particularly like riparian zones. Um, and we've had some challenges so far, so I'm excited to hear what other people have done. Excellent. Great. Thanks. <laughs> and, and to the kitty. <laughs> um, so I've heard a number of, of hot topics. Um, I heard underground mapping, urban mapping, talk about rigs, um, using GIS, energy, emergency response, land use and challenges. There's all kinds of really cool things to talk about. Um, does somebody have one really pressing or interesting that, that we'd like to kick off with? Bronwyn, are you trying to? Yeah, I think we, we've still got um, a couple a couple folks. To oh, below, I think. Um, Am I missing? I'm sorry. Jesse? Yeah, yeah. So there's Jesse. Oh no, Jesse what? Oh, I'm sorry. No, maybe I'm. <laughs> Thanks for paying attention, Bronwyn. <laughs> Did we get everybody? Sorry. Twin, it's so good to see you. Evil twin. <laughs> All right. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. That's okay. Is, did we get everyone? Is there anyone else? All right. Okay. Bronwyn, did you guys want to put forward one of the a topic? Um, yeah, I mean, I know that that, that some folks uh, probably uh, sort of a little a little bit 
about kind of what they're working so on. So we might go around and kind of look at some of that stuff um, as well. But uh, yeah, um, I mean, as far as far as a topic, I think one of one of the, one of the questions I, I have is just sort of how how people sort of found their way to sort of this kind of aerial mapping tool and sort of how how you've sort of adjusted it to kind of work for the for the things that you're doing um you know why why this tool and not another tool um anybody kind of wants to and this in? is free form so go yeah. for it so i can start off uh, with uh, some of the guanus mapping we've been doing and essentially we want the highest resolution possible to look for clues for stuff that's very difficult to find small fragments of information so I'm going to hold up an aerial, uh, which is actually a very good aerial. Now, this is a commercial aerial put out by an Australian company called Nearmat, and they put them out every four months, and they're very high resolution. And uh, so they're very useful. And what I've overlaid on top of it is a yellow line, which indicates an old historical dam that I'm particularly interested in because it happens to run across the Jared Kushner property. And by establishing its exact mapping, we can then have it declared an American battlefield site. And so what we had done in prior runs, I'm gonna hold up another aerial, is this is one of the ones that we did about five years ago before near map came along. And it is just simply more accurate because we can see more. And so we recognize that commercial aerial photography will simply be able to be more comprehensive and faster than us, but it will not be higher resolution. So the key niche that I'm still maintaining uh, and researching is how can I get the maximum resolution possible? Oh, oh yeah, this is Donald Trump. This is called the Make Guanus Great Again project. And this is one of the early aerial stream mapping resolutions that we did where we were able to zoom in right in on the Kushner site. And so what we want to do this year is actually do sub-inch resolution of every square inch of the archaeological site so that we can define exactly where the buried colonial dam was. Uh, because by establishing that, we can then get a lot of credibility in the American Battlefield Application Grant Program that we're doing. And the community purpose is to maximize setback from the waterfront edge. And by getting this very high resolution aerial mapping where we can show a pattern of tones or cracks in the asphalt, we can say the dam was actually really there. And then that'll save us a lot of time uh, with directing the archaeological survey. So I'm just throwing out the topic that certain commercial vendors now have gotten better than what we uh, need for most analysis, but they still haven't replaced the micro scale resolution uh, that the aerial mapping can still do. So the, the key technical focus should be on how to um, do lot level or site level analysis rather than to try to compete uh, with larger multi-block areas. So I'm just throwing that out there and it only applies to certain area, you know, urban areas where that those kind of services are, are available and does not apply to rural or uh, developing country areas where there is no such coverage. So I'm just throwing out some of the d dilemmas that we're dealing with here. Um, is there any, uh, depending upon the depth that you're looking for, is there any possibility of utilizing ground penetrating radar, which can now be rented very cheaply on a daily or weekly basis? Absolutely, and that has been done in other sites, but when you have a huge parking lot, it's very useful to know uh, that this is, you can do the preliminary chalk marks based on your aerial observations, so you can first sketch out, this is where we think it roughly was based on the pattern of subsidence that we see in the grassroots mapping aerials. And we actually have uh, been able to do that where um, if you look at, at this tiny little corner here, uh, there is a pattern of green weeds uh, that is visible uh, in, the, in the concrete. And so that pattern of subsidence shows you where the old stream bed was. So the fact that the weeds go only in some cracks and not others is the kind of thing that you're not gonna be able to see on a Google scale aerial photograph. And so 
the big asset is learning how to read clues that you've never looked at before. Like people normally don't notice weeds, but they have a very specific geographic distribution and they grow here and not there for very particular reasons. And then once you start learning how to read that, you start seeing them all over the place where the, um, uh, the uh, buried industrial architecture was that you were looking for, old building footings and old mill, mill runs and whatnot. We just yell. You want to yell? Yeah. Ayman. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Daniel of Prospect Park. Question for you on the uh, conforming mm -hmm. or the mapping of your high res to the low res imagery, the commercial, relatively low res imagery uh, that, you, that you find. How do you uh, do that mapping? How do you stretch your images in a, in a precise manner that's somehow calibrated to come up with a, a conformal? Unification. Maps. That's an excellent question. So, for example, when we did mapping of Prospect Park, we were looking for some of the spring heads in North Meadow, and what you have are big blobs of green, uh, which are very difficult to stitch together. So you can stitch them together because you can see a person lying there. But in a homogeneous surface like that, it's not a bad idea to actually put maybe sticks of white uh, uh, wood so that you can, when you're taking multiple pictures, uh, you have something to lock, lock your images together. And then there will still also be some aerial distortion depending on the angle that's taken. And so ideally you need a rig that is as flat as possible on a windless day. So you don't spend hours trying to adjust uh, distorted imagery. But in the case of Prospect Park, we were able to stitch together some of the, uh, the green pieces together, but then the problem is just locking it into the larger context, and that's where the overall area was useful because you can start trying to match some of that, but now you have a higher pixel resolution. Thank you. The map knitter is actually a perfect tool for that because it provides the uh, existing Google aerials. And now what you can actually do is you can actually download custom aerials, re-upload them, and then use them sort of as an interim base for stitching small aerials that you want to composite. So one trick is to go zoom in from a larger aerial to the finer resolution aerial. And I do that a lot with the historical mapping because in some cases in the landscape has changed so much, you cannot go from what you see in 2017 to what was there in 1860. You need to find intermediate maps from the 1850s. First, block them in and then put in the 1924 aerial and then the 1924 aerial may have a tree or an old industrial building that then you will see as a remnant in your aerial photograph and then you can exactly position it on what is now just a flat homogeneous parking lot. So la layering, layering of aerial photography over time is, is important for the grassroots mapping to be successful. So you, and you can get those aerials online. And so there's no such thing as bad aerials. Everything's good. It's just you're zooming in at a higher resolution uh, with your grassroots uh, digital photography. I was hoping to go for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Somebody in, in next to Bronwyn. I sense it. <laughs> ah. I was gonna I was I was gonna invite someone who's been working in a rural context to briefly share next. Okay. <laughs> Did you have somebody in mind? <laughs> Laura, um, and Jesse, I'm not sure what you're, what you're just outside. Yeah. <laughs> Lexington's <laughs> a city. <laughs> <laughs> even, even if it doesn't fit New York standards of a city, it's still a city. <laughs> oh, we did that. I can share my screen really quickly for a second. Great, thank you. Let me give this a try and see if I can make this work. Can you all see this? Say I think Jesse is a critical geographer, right? <laughs> Technically speaking, yeah. Can you guys see this? Not yet. No. No, not yet. Wait, hold on. Let me try one more time. Sharing screen and let's see. Oh wait, here we go. 
How about this? Can you see this? You see that? Yay, okay. All right, here we are. Um, so I'm working on this project called the Appalachian Mountain Top Patrol. Um, and the project is a collaboration with grassroots activists in the coal fields of West Virginia to use documentary filmmaking, but also aerial photography and video surveillance and also water quality testing um, to sort of tell this complex story about uh, the experience of living in close proximity to mountaintop removal. And so the drones that we use to gather aerial images have been a really important and central part of this project, not only because it kind of gives an opportunity to visualize the space that wasn't previously available. Um, an organization called South Wings has been doing flights over the region for quite a while. However, that is only able to capture images from a certain altitude, which a plane could fly. But what the drone really offered this project is that people could sort of autonomously go out and explore this space um, and both be able to sort of chronicle uh, things before they change, because things change very fast in terms of how fast the landscape is sort of obliterated after a permit is, uh, is approved, and then also to do aerial monitoring. And so it really has these two sort of spheres of, you know, on one hand monitoring and looking for infractions to be prosecuted, and the other hand being able to tell stories about the space. And so here are just some stills from shots that we've gotten from our um, drone work. This is the Brushy Fork Surrey and Pound, which has about 7 billion gallons of toxic waste that is positioned behind a very large earthen dam um, over many communities there. And so this has really been a way for people to be able to visualize it in a way that was not previously available. So I'm just gonna go through because I have all sorts of stuff going on here. Um, in addition to other things that we do in the project, we also then, when activists see something that is could possibly be an infraction, that's where they go down on the ground onto the mine site. Um, it's not legal to access the, mine, access the mine site, but they go down and they take water quality samples and they also um, gather imagery sort of from the ground. So it's working from an aerial context and also from the ground. Um, and people, there's just some images of people in the project learning how to use the drone. And I'm gonna kind of go through this pretty quickly. Here's just more of the brushy fork slurry impoundment right here. So this has been an exciting thing for people because these areas are really off limits, but they cause a lot of anxiety within the local community because of the possibility of them um, being compromised. So it becomes important to be able to see them. One of the, here's another uh, permit that we're actively monitoring. This is the Middle Ridge permit. And so this is a permit specifically where they've been able to from the drone be able to identify where they see things like dried drainage ditches, which becomes a really good clue as to the fact that the environmental engineering on the site is not up to code. And that allows people to go down on the ground and take pictures and also locate where drainage pipes might be actually illegally um, dumping waste into local waterways. So one of the exciting things that happened actually recently at the Appalachia Bar Barn Raising is that we have a possible collaboration with SkyTruth um, to start incorporating more satellite imagery into our work. One of the things that we sort of have to deal with is that flying, you know, to access these sites to even fly the drone over them, oftentimes you have to trespass and that can really open you up to, um, you know, prosecution and arrest and imprisonment. And so people really have to put a lot on the line to get these images. And so it becomes a sort of wonderful way to also be able to um, monitor these sites remotely without having to comply with trespassing issues or with the drone regulation laws, which are sort of making their way, making their rounds through the West Virginia State Legislature. Another thing that we do in the project is we connect with the local community and allow people to request a flyover. And so when they request a flyover, someone will come out to their house um, from Cold River Mountain Watch, which is one of the main organizations that I collaborate with, to uh, use the drone to help them look around and sort of see how the landscape has changed around their house. Because these sites are on corporate owned land, it's often very hard for people to know it all, what is happening sort of behind the tree line there. So here you can see at the top, here's just a flight. This is um, this person's house and he's lived in this house for, for decades. And so we were able to do a flight above his house and then allow him to sort of see the way that the mining permits have progressed or have had sort of expanded 
over time. Um, so you can see it sort of tilts up to this massive mining operation uh, that's happening right behind this person's house. And so because this is such a contentious issue within the community, because mountaintop removal and coal mining provide the few jobs that are available in the region, it becomes important to figure out sort of new creative ways to intersect or talk with the community about these issues because it is so fraught with emotion. Um, yeah, and then here's, here's some trail camps that we're using, but that's a little off topic. Um, so yeah, that, that's sort of where we are with the project right now. And I'm gonna go ahead and try to unshare the screen. Did I unshare my screen successfully? You did. Awesome, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, no problem. Question? Laura, this yeah. is Daniel from Prospect Park, New York. Hi. Are you going to maps from the drone imagery, or is that not uh, an important part of your project? We're not creating maps specifically. We're analyzing the visual data that we get from the drones or using it for storytelling because it has sort of this sublime quality to be able to experience these, these mountains and these operations from the air. So, yeah, it's less about creating maps and more about sort of tracking permits um, from the perspective of activists who are looking for violations because mm -hmm. the strategy is because there's so little recourse within the community once a permit starts, once a permit is approved and it gets started, the strategy is to really monitor those infractions very closely so you can cost that operation as much money as possible and make it less and less worth it for them to move forward with these permits. Technical question, what kind of cameras are you using on the drones? Are they the ones that come with the drones or do you have to come with the We're just using a DJI Phantom 3, which has been a really good way to get started with the drones because it's one of those sort of out of the box products where, you know, particularly um, one of my collaborators who grew up playing Grand Theft Auto, it becomes very easy for people to sort of translate and operate and master these uh, this technology. Um, based on their previous experience of doing things like playing video games. And so that's really good because, because we're working in a, with a variety of technologies, including video cameras, and now we're starting to edit and do things like that. It's been really helpful to have it be pretty straightforward. Like once you learn how to not crash the drone, then it's pretty easy to be able to, uh, to gather these images and get really compelling images. And ones that are useful for being able to really look at these sites. Um, the drone that we use now, which is one of the older generations at this point, films in 4K, and that's very helpful because then you can actually zoom in on an, zoom in on an image in a way that you couldn't otherwise and get a lot of detail to kind of analyze that space. Thanks, Laura. You're welcome. Um, and it's great. Can I call? Can I come back to what you were saying? I would. I would love to hear about some of the challenges that you're having. I was interested in your project. Um, I think I, I did through the grapevine hear a little bit about it. Um, so I'm excited to to hear more. And if we can workshop a little bit with some of the, the things that you're struggling with. Um, okay. So um, we ended up focusing on uh, riparian zones. So what? So what's happening in the area is that there's um, big algae blooms in the two um, sort of dammed up, they're, they're actually impoundments, they're not really lakes, but, but people use them as lakes. Um, there's big blue-green algae blooms and it's coming essentially from ex excess sediment coming off the landscape. And so we're, my team is trying to look at um, stream corridors and um, the issue of whether there are, there is sufficient riparian vegetation or whether people are essentially farming straight up to the stream bank. And, um, and so we happened, so, so somebody else happened to already have a public lab uh, balloon and kite mapping kit. And my students um, started playing with the kite and were able to get the kite up and, and going. But then, um, but then when, when it came to actually being near the streams, that's when it got to be tough because 
um, because oftentimes you're down in sort of a, a basin and then there's not enough, enough uh, wind or there's, if, if there is riparian vegetation, then it's like, then there's trees and you can't really map that. I mean, you can't really fly the kite there or there's power lines. Um, so right now we're experimenting with um, getting someone to fly a drone for us for some of the imaging and then we've got a we've got an unknown amount of helium so we're we're waiting we're we're so we're also doing water um, not just water quality testing but but sort of on the ground stream assessment of different segments and then we're going to hopefully have a few days to go out and try the balloon and see how it works. Um, just from reading the stuff on, on the public lab site, it sounded like maybe the balloon, maybe it would be worthwhile to fill up the balloon and then, um, and then have it, you know, do as much imaging as we could quickly. Um, so yeah, so hopefully by the end of the summer, we'll have some like comparisons of different techniques that then we can um, see what will work. I mean, my goal in the long term is to try to get more people in the bigger, in the larger watershed interested in doing imaging themselves rather than just me and a couple of students going out and doing it. So. Liz, Liz can talk a bit about fishpole mapping, which would be ideal for these kind of riverbank uh, situations where you have lots of trees on either side that create logistical headaches for flying. But if you walk along a stream bed with uh, galoshes, you can actually get a pole 50 feet up, getting a very good angle of all the vegetation types on either side of the stream bank that can often give you very good clues to the biotic health of the riparian corridor because different vegetation types will be representative of different nutrient levels or pollution levels. And then if the resolution of the pole, fish pole mapping is high enough, you can identify the species and start using those species inventory <laughs> health uh, indicators. So Liz can maybe talk a bit about some of the, the new work mapping they did that I found that I, I've actually, I'm going to start using more here precisely for the logistical situations that you described, where it's a headache to just navigate through high, heavy tree areas. Right. Yeah, so we did, so yeah, we didn't get a poll uh, yet, but we, I did experiment a little bit with, with, um, with a poll. Okay, so this is a, an appliance that we happen to have that's for changing your light bulbs when you have a high ceiling. So I, I messed around a little bit with, with that and, um, and an app called Mapillary, which will, will uh, which is open source for uh, like Google Street View. Okay. So rather than trying to um, have to stitch together the photos afterwards, if you can can use that app, then then it kind of automatically puts one photo after the other using your your GPS device or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that pole is only mm, like three meters maybe right. high or something. So I feel like yeah, if we could get a bigger pole, then that potentially could be a good option. You know. Liz, do you want to talk a bit about how the fish poles work, whether they broke broke over time or whether you found any models that are suitable for longer term wear? Um, uh, around New York, I used um, really long extendable fishing poles, mostly with the urban gardening community because they wanted that plant by plant resolution. And um, in some cases, they were making maps of their garden. In other cases, they were tracking um, in a merry, merry, quite contrary, how does your garden grow kind of a project. Um, but yeah, I could definitely recommend. And in New York, we do have um, poles to lend out and um, maybe you can mail you one. You know what? Bamboo also works very well, but PVC gets kind of heavy. Yeah. <laughs> Flex is too much, but bamboo, yeah, I agree. It's yeah, because I was going to say the other thing, okay, so this, these little stream corridors are like, the stream is like, Mm, somewhere between 
five to 15 feet wide, maybe. Mm -hmm. And then on the outside, because it's July in Wisconsin, there's like five foot tall grass or there's a bank and then some trees or something. But it's definitely like, yeah, you have to walk through the stream corridor basically like in the stream in order to, a lot of the time, in order to get any imagery because it's, it's really challenging to walk on the bank. <laughs> How deep are the streams? So it, it, so far what we've seen is it varies, but it's like, um, my students are going out in, in, um, waders. And so they're the, the deepest would mostly would be like waist high. And so, so mostly, but, um, but there's just a whole variety of different kinds of, um, vegetation, which is sort of what, you know, we want to see is, um, I mean, it would be interesting to see the stream bed because in a lot of places there is a lot of sedimentation, which is like the problem, I guess I'm, what I'm saying is the problem of, of mapping these stream corridors is that the, the sediment washes in when there's a big storm and then what's left behind is this layer of sediment on the, on the stream bed, but if you were going to test the water quality right then it wouldn't necessarily be bad it's just when the stream when the storm event happens that the water quality gets bad so i'm kind of trying to look for other signs of places that are problems um is it <laughs> can i ask another question when when yeah. the water quality gets bad is it something visual that you can see like yeah, during so, the storm event yeah so the my understanding from talking to the geologists here is that essentially the phosphorus um, comes from from excessive um, fertilization and on the farm fields and then the farm fields um, the phosphorus binds with the soil and so then it's when the soil actually washes into the stream that's what we're really looking for which um, which you can see in a lot of places the the sediment is coating the bottom of the streams. So yeah, I think that when there's a storm, a little kitty is, um, I think when there's a storm, uh, yeah, you basically see the water is, is going to be brown and cloudy. Um, and, and then, um, you know, eventually that washes into the lakes, which um, provides nutrients for this algae to bloom. So that's another possibility, like in the future, we might try to to um, get imagery of the algae blooms and try to do um, the, the near infrared imaging of, of the blooms to, to map that too, but we haven't gotten there yet. What technology that's been used for the scenario you, you just described are uh, videos, cameras mounted on little rubber duckies. So a friend uh, called Steve Duncan has uh, this project called Action Ducks. <laughs> where he has uh, Jerry rigged uh, little bathroom duckies with uh, video camera gear for precisely underground sewer stream mapping. So he'll release his duckies into the sewers uh, so that he can get footage that'll give him clues as to where the entry points of the streams are. And this is in an even worse logistical situation than what you have. It's underground with very low light conditions. But certainly in a, in a uh, stream bed condition like what you have, you might want to consider some submarine type action duck. Uh, duck. That's awesome. That's awesome. And so, it'll, yeah. You can also pick up the, some of the sediment fluctuations. You get these very slick sediment fields uh, in the stream bed that may show discharge points that are useful for your data collecting. Wait, so are you talking about that the, the, the camera is pointing down into the water or, in the, in or just case, he has it forward? forward. You can rig it any way you need for your logistical purposes. He's doing sewer pipes and he's looking for side inflows. He's looking for a 360 degree like what the duck would see. But you could also do it from, you know, what a fish would see if you wanted to do it that way. Um, but, but so how does he catch the ducks then afterwards? Uh, he has it on a large string. He's got a big fishing reel. So he sends it down and then he reels it back in. Um, oh. That's how he goes and lights it out for 200 feet into the sewer uh, because some parts are just too dangerous to get into and then he sends action duck in and then he reels them back out. 
<laughs> oh, that's fascinating. Okay. I like it. Um, I, I guess I'd say, like, I think a few of us as well, if the stream is deep enough and you can get in the middle of it and you don't have an obstruction overhead in the middle, I mean, there's uh -huh. no reason that you can get someone in the back with a balloon um, and of a kayak or a canoe and float it that way. Uh, we've done that a lot down in Louisiana, um, and I know you all do that on Guanas. Yeah, but those are more for tidal wetland situations. You're, you're talking more riparian forested streams here, right? Which is... Yeah, so I, I mean, I think these streams would have been all forested. Now, what we've seen so far is a mix of, of sort of grassy wetlands, farm fields, and then actual forested riparian zones. So I think that the grassy areas are just in the process of trying to grow back into forested areas. But, you know, I'm, I'm kind of new to the area, so I don't know for sure. But then that raises the technical question of what kind of cameras work the best for taking subtle shades of green. Um, and so one of my favorite cameras was a Canon, Canon S100 that did a beautiful job of capturing like different green chlorophyll levels, but it's very flimsy, so it tends to die easily in the rough and tough environment of uh, balloon map. Uh, so I'd, huh, okay. I'd love to find a camera that has those same features, but you can bang around a bit. Huh, okay. That's a technical issue that certain spectrums in vegetation, like if you use the wrong kind of camera, it all comes out a flattish green when a lot of the data that you're looking for is extremely subtle. It'd be just a slight tinge of yellow, slight tinge of brown. And so you need a particular, the, the kind of camera you use is actually critical. Okay, yeah, the, I mean, the imagery that is, is just available out there, it's hard, especially for students and folks to really interpret, you know, the, even the, you know, the categorization of land use that's out there oftentimes seems like it's not correct. And so that's, yeah, that's where we're like, well, what's really going on on the ground in these different sites, um, yeah, where it would be really useful to have this high resolution imagery of the vegetation. All right. <clears throat> um, so we have also just in terms of, if you wanna workshop some ideas and anything further, um, there is another call tomorrow afternoon um, that we just take general project ideas or anyone who wants to come. So if you wanna think about this some more and bat around some more questions, um, yeah. every Tuesday afternoon is an opportunity to come in and check back in and, and bounce ideas around as well. It's on the Public Lab events page. Okay, great, thank you very much. Sure. Yeah, and, and, and I know we're, we're kind of getting close to the end of the hour, but but I would love to hear from some of the folks that, that haven't had a chance to, to talk yet, like uh, Jesse and, and Justin and, you know, just uh, Michael, Michael, Michael um, uh, Scott, if you want to jump in in a minute, I know maybe we'll go over just a tiny bit if we can, but um, I don't know, just, Jesse, do you want to talk about your work just a little bit? Oh, I think you're on mute, so. I was trying to hit the unmute button. Okay, <laughs> got it. So, for the most part, what I've been doing is working with students, teaching them how to do balloon mapping. Yeah. And um, trying to work it into work I've been doing, community mapping. Um, but a lot of times get, get uh, sort of resistance from people to not using Google Maps. So I'm curious how other people run into this if you're working with a, a community partner who thinks that Google Maps are sort of the end all be all of the world, how do you convince them to use their own imagery? I mean, I can make students do it, but I can't uh, necessarily make a community partner realize that, you know, having your own imagery is beneficial. So I'm curious how other people deal with that, making people make imagery. Yeah. Well, there's no, uh, there's the provenance of the of Google Maps, and you don't necessarily know the epoch in which it was uh, uh, filmed. And oftentimes, as Ian was mentioning, you can get higher resolution with the mapping that you get from your own camera. But uh, I think also uh, a lot of the 
I mean, you say it's Google Maps. It's mostly the federal government that's running these planes. Yes. They're mostly times for leap off time. So if you're trying to get some kind of plant phenology, you, you find that most of the photo sets are in the fall or the winter because that's when the aerial photography, you know, if they're mapping a whole state, a whole region, they can get leaf off imagery that can actually see the ground through the tree canopy. I guess, uh, you know, uh, uh, we've done a lot of stuff on the Gulf Coast and what comes to mind is we, there was a hunter who wanted to show the benefits of a certain river restoration down in Blackman's Parish. Uh, he wanted to show that restoring the river into the wetlands brought a lot of submerged vegetation, but that vegetation only really shows up in the summertime months. And if you look at Google Earth today, I mean, it's all November. And so it just looks like bare sand, but every, when he's out there, it's, it's flourishing and that's great habitat for all the fish and birds. Uh, so we were able to uh, go out with him from his boat. And in this case, this was, uh, this was a case where it wasn't just one little spot, it was actually a square mile of area. So we were able to put the balloon up about 3,000 feet, uh, which is more than south wind. You know, south wind, you mentioned south winds is too high for some things. And that's true, but they also go too fast. Uh, I've even flown in aerobatic planes that can, you know, shut the engine off. So traveling too fast to like the image um, with the balloon, we were able to go really high and yet still get centimeter level imagery that allows you to see all the different kinds of vegetation that is a duck hunter. See all that nice, you know, duck forage. So even though it was a big image, it was a square mile, it was still very high resolution at a particular time of the year that, uh, you know, wasn't being captured in the normal surveys. Another example is uh, I work for the Department of Transportation right now and one useful data set that we're going to be doing is right after it snows, we want to see where cars don't go because then those snack downs, those bump outs of white snowy areas on the street are perfect places for designing pedestrian plazas. And so we would love to get used like on demand aerial photography to get three hours after a snowstorm, before the snow melts, a pattern of a corridor that we're studying for traffic safety reasons uh, for a community group. And so Queens Boulevard has several neighborhood transportation alternative groups advocating for bicycle lanes and being able to get snow imagery three hours after it snows allows them to build the argument that this is where logically we can put a bike lane without interfering with traffic patterns. Um, I just want to take a quick second and interrupt conversation just to thank everyone for coming to open hour. Um, we're just about at the top of the hour. So before anyone jumps off, I want to say thank you. And um, I'd like to leave the line open and uh, for people to share and continue and feel free as you need to just um, hop off and, and um, we, will, we will nod to goodbye and thanks to your coming. <laughs> Great, thank you. We, we really would like to hear, where am I? We really would like to hear from the people we haven't seen in a long time, like um, Michael Magurski. I haven't seen you in like really a long time. <laughs> so there's that. And then also we have, um, you know, new people. Um, Mr. Putzer, who I'm not, I can't pronounce this string of consonants, but uh, yeah. And Justin, who I've been mostly seeing you in, 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 other communities zoom calls so yes i know we live our lives on zoom yeah <laughs> i don't have anything specific to add or to ask i'm just yeah just uh learning more and and there's a there's a possible project that one of the students at michigan is working on um he's trying to develop a zooniverse project around canopy diameter in um in rainforests in Peru, um, and the satellite imagery he has, he has access to, um, it's really hard to distinguish uh, the types of, of uh, sort of tree, the trees he's looking for. There is a very little amount of drone imagery um, that is really good and, is, and would actually allow for this, and so I'm gonna send him this recording after it's posted uh, to, to have him thinking about, think about this, so. That's all I have to add, but this is awesome. Um, 
I'm excited to share this with other folks at Michigan who are interested in doing stuff like this. If he's doing tree canopy studies, you should consider using LIDAR data. So the city, for example, has flown a commercial LIDAR data set. And what I've done here is in little green dots have highlighted all the biggest trees in my watershed with the uh, height of the tree. The logic being that wherever there's a big tree, there's usually a spring because big trees like lots of water. So the question that that raises is whether there is a possibility for DIY LIDAR because some of the uh, new uh, chip technologies in cell phones are making it possible to mount uh, depth, depth resolution measurements. And that's a debate that we can, or a line of inquiry we, we should get into in the next couple of years because uh, DIY LIDAR might be something that becomes technically accessible. Cool, thank you. Uh, I can also uh, send you a listing of um, some of the data sources that uh, we were able to pull together at the barn raising and uh, Sky Truth, for example, has access to, uh, uh, and actually any of us could get access to the European uh, Space Agency's uh, Sentinel 1 and 2. In addition, there's a, a, a private firm uh, that uh, theoretically one can get uh, ambassador status, uh, which would give you very high resolution data for a limited number of counties, uh, depending upon your interests. And uh, of course, another, uh, uh, I, I can send, uh, Steve, do you have everybody's uh, access information who's online? I can, I, post, <laughs> I can post my email in the chat. Okay, in which case uh, I can uh, post that out in terms of the uh, array of sources of data that uh, are available for remote sensing. You gave me a great plug moment, Gilbert. <laughs> um, so I'll, uh, I'll actually put the recording up on the public lab um, the Open Hour Archive page, and below that, all the links that anyone wants to share or any tools or information, I'll compile all those um, and post them up with the archive. Um, so if anyone has any resources or anything, Gilbert, I'll, I'll grab that page that you're talking about, and anyone else, just throw them in the chat, um, and I'll put them all together um, with the archive post. Okay. I don't have very much to add, except uh, just nice to hear from everybody and sort of curious what things are happening in this area that would be useful to city governments in particular. So that's, that's sort of my interest here. Now, didn't you also show up and say, whoa, didn't you also show up and say something about um, uh, working in Peru and Guyana? Oh, God, that's not me. That's just an organization whose board I'm on. Uh, that's a... Uh, Gregor McLennan and Emily Jacoby and a little bit of Seth Fitzsimmons uh, under the uh, digital democracy name. Yeah. Yeah, they're doing some wild stuff down there. I should see if they're uh, available for one of these. Yes. Um, yeah, whoever was asking, uh, whoever had the rainforest situation, Justin, I think it was you. Yeah, please look at digital democracy. Okay. Good luck on the visitation, Mr. Prutzer. Thank you. It's been great just to be a fly on the wall a little bit for this first time around here about um, different people's projects. The only thing I was wondering too is that um, with the current kit build out right now, just in terms of what you know kinds of steps have been taken or what people, if anyone has been experimenting with, um, <clears throat> excuse me, different kinds of lighter weight cameras and how those have been holding up with rigs thus far. I, I can report in from uh, from Somerville. Um, we had a this is actually co covered in the Atlas Obscura article that came out a few days ago uh, because uh, Kara uh, uh, actually lives in my neighborhood. But um, I I did that thing sometimes people uh, have do where you you take a a carabiner and you wrap it around the the string a few times and then um, as long as the string is under tension it it doesn't fall uh, but I did it with like a camera one of these new GoPro uh, alternatives it's like a cheap GoPro uh, in a in a waterproof crash case these cameras are about $40 and they pretend to be 4k but they're actually pretty good uh, not actually 4k um, but uh, uh, so <laughs> the difference was unlike a carabiner it didn't actually lock into a ring it just sort of like wrapped around a part and so when it went slack, instead of sliding a little bit along the string, it just fell off at about 70 feet above the ground uh, onto pavement. And the camera is actually fine. I was amazed. So 
not recommend not recommended but um scott you got to get one of these cameras because uh, it's also it's also waterproof um uh, the button got a little bit a little bit dented but besides that the thing is like perfectly good um so i was i was pretty impressed by that i won't do that again but um so there even, even though they're camera i got you too the pink one I got you is one of these. I'm going to be experimenting. I'm going to be experimenting with that in the next couple of weeks. With, with and a hammer. <laughs> um, <laughs> the other thing um, that's nice about them, although the image quality is just, I would say, medium. It's not like a Canon camera, but um, uh, they have a, an issue. There, the lens, there, it's, very, it's like fisheye. Uh, but we have a project uh, to remove fisheye from images using just a web page. And uh, uh, we recently sort of fired that project back up. So I hope there's only one remaining bug in it. It, it, it can only process square images mm -hmm. uh, for some reason, which is really a bummer. But um, we're hopefully going to get past that bug pretty soon. And uh, that'll, I think, open up a lot of new camera opportunities where previously, they, you know, you have this problem that a lot of these small cameras, uh, you know, just I guess based on the geometry, uh, have um, pretty serious fisheye lenses. <laughs> Or I guess because people want that for some purposes, although not for mapping. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering, which is with the use of a kind of action camera, because I mean, that's what I'm getting for now in anticipation for the kit. So it's at least good to hear. I mean, I know we'll probably all be experimenting <laughs> together to see how the imagery does and all, but it's good to hear that even, you know, if it falls from 70 feet in the air <laughs> that, you know, there's, there's hope yet. So that's, that's <laughs> thank you for sharing. It's got the, the, the 70 foot seal of approval. <laughs> Usually salt water will kill everything. Uh, Cover the chip. That's what you well, want. I, I sent one to the New Orleans office, so you might as well start testing it, you know? <laughs> by, by which I mean I dunking it. I haven't seen it. I'll have to look. Oh, yeah? yeah? You got the squid kite, though, right? Or, or no. You guys used what? a regular kite? Did you use a regular kite, Scott? Just, I, I got a lot of at-bats. Oh. There might be some toys that are, are sitting there waiting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, I just want to also say it's really great to see some folks who I haven't in a while. Uh, and uh, I got to sign off now, but uh, have a great evening. <laughs> Thanks, 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 I have to row back to shore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to sign off as well. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 I was going to say, the little tiny cameras, uh, the one that, that Public Club has had in the store for a while um, and that has been modifying for near-infrared, um, it's the, just a little Mobius camera. Mm -hmm. um, those are, I, we've been using those for a long time and what, honestly, the thing that I do is just take your regular point-and-shoot camera and put that inside the soda bottle rig and use the tiny Mobius and just duct tape it to the outside and it's gone. I've had the same camera for years and it's been really, it doesn't mind. <laughs> yeah, I just didn't know if there'd be a concern with the weight of a, of a point and shoot. Mm, I think or, we, I mean, we started out with uh, point and shoots that were at least half a kilogram. And so that means you need about a, at least a kilogram, really two kilograms of lift, either from the balloon or the kite. I think on the Gulf Coast, like the winds change all the time. so. That was, you know, the balloon was such more uh, effective when you had those point and shoots that need the two AA batteries that add a lot of weight. And that means if you're using the balloon, you're waiting for that summer day, which sometimes you have to do, like for that duck hunter, that big map uh, with the duck grass, we wanted to get really high. We needed to wait for the right day. I mean, there's just no way around it. But I think the, this one, you know, this thing is 0.2 kilograms. So it's like half of the weight of anything. It's got the rechargeable battery. Mm -hmm. um, and that just, I think, uh, you know, just for kicks, uh, Miriam and I picked a day, just picked a Saturday, you know, and just went out and were able to get um, good imagery of a, a wetland project, even though the wind was pretty low, you know, it was like less than 10. Um, so I think the, the movie, the Mobius has, you know, in, uh, kind of, expanded like how much uh, you know what what is what are the conditions for kite photography for me so it's exciting to have something even lighter with cooler yeah uh with the light cameras though you do have to make sure that they're pretty well stabilized you know with a heavier camera it'll just the weight of it will hold the, 
straight down but some of the if it's really light it you'll like it'll be permanently kind of at a 20 degree you know off the off the up and down unless you have a good you know this one doesn't have a single button but if you have a big you need that big uh wing out, out the back um but uh, hydrogen I have a question about hydrogen yeah. <laughs> and uh jesse laughing <laughs> Do you want to recount uh, our explorations in the hydrogen, Jesse? <laughs> I have a good idea how they ended. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, the, I think the only reason we haven't done hydrogen on the Gulf Coast, uh, Dan Beavers from uh, <laughs> a big fan of hydrogen, is because actually it's hard to get the tanks. Uh, the only tanks that seem to be available are these huge 330 cubic yard tanks that. You know, you need a big old truck to move that around. The helium, you can be able to get like the 80 cubic yard. What? You're just going to make your own, I'd say. Oh. Yeah, there was, there's a video online of someone using a Jeep engine to create hydrogen. Yeah. Uh -huh. It ends poorly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> As did the Hindenburg. Yeah. <laughs> it's not hard to make. It is hard to make safely. Yeah. Well, <laughs> how do you put it into a balloon? Yeah, carefully. No, but but one of the things I mean with the light the lightweight cameras, part of the reason that the the mini kits that we're looking at now are still kind of in the prototyping phase is that kind of you know the tiny lightweight cameras are are great to go up with sort of a minimal amount of lift, but then we do have to kind of figure out how we're gonna kind of get them stabilized and pointing down consistently when you know when their lightness makes them want to sort of dip around. But I think one of the, you know, it, it's nice that there are a lot of kind of GoPro clones out there and the cost of them is, is gone way down. Um, I think one of the things that, that we're probably going to start looking at are sort of possibilities for things like Raspberry Pi cameras and, you know, we'll just see how, how little we can get stuff um, and how pointing at what we wanted to point at. But, um, but it's 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 kind of fun to kind of be troubleshooting a new a new scale for for some of this stuff. Um, anyway. Yeah, I, I've I've learned a lot about stability from Chris Fasty and his um, kits that he has available on his uh, Capitry K A B T E R Y. <laughs> he sells these three D printed things, which have worked out. You know. Yes and no. I mean, I've melted so many of those things in my car. <laughs> very hot in Louisiana, but I think I've like learned a lot from the design concepts that he's used uh, um, to stabilize. Um, yeah. I kind of wonder, has anybody set up one of the little mini cameras on like a pick of a type thing situation? Yeah. I, yeah. Oh. yeah, I mean, the yeah. pick of a is great. I mean, uh, I've got, um, a very light aluminum one. I've never tried to make my own, but people have a little mini pick of a wood and you know little eyelet screws you could get from the hardware store. It just takes a little bit of not, you know, a little bit of not uh, knowledge, and you could probably make a pretty lightweight pick of a. Um, one I had probably doubles the weight. Very obvious, but um, toothpick pick of a. <laughs> Oh, well. Yeah. I have built one actually out of super tiny, it looks like an erector set stuff you can get in the drawers there at Lowe's. Oh, cool. The problem with it was on a kite, the kite caught the wind and all that ended up happening was my camera, so it was one of these kind of deals, yeah. just was attached to the peak of it. And it just kept getting slammed to the outfield fence of the baseball oh. diamond that I was taking pictures of because the, the kite just got away from me, but the, the peak of it had nothing but the camera attached to it. So it was super lightweight, but no protection for the camera. So that was how I learned how to change the lenses. On <laughs> I don't recommend doing that. I really don't. Some padding is good. Yeah. Even just a little toothpick, you know, uh, out of the, the range of the lens, but yeah. sticking, sticking just past the lens. Uh, helps a lot. You just tape it, or uh, it goes a long way for those moments you you didn't predict. Um, I, 
I think uh, Matt Lippincott one time even let lend me, uh, I think, you know, there's the KAP community, the Kite Aerial Photography community. We make some pretty light aluminum stuff that's remote control to control pan and tilt. Um, of course, that starts adding, you start adding costs probably above um, what the public lab, uh, even the old kit costs. But that could be useful. Folks, thanks for your camaraderie. Stevie, I'll, I'll see you early in the morning. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Sorry, I should disappear. Okay. Bye, Gilbert. Okay. Bye. Yeah, and like Stevie said earlier, um, you know, our, this open call is once a month. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, go for it. Um, but every <laughs> Every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern, and other times and other time zones, we are having like a like an office hours kind of a thing. And you can see publiclab.org slash events. And there's always a few of us on there. So Phil, you know, on a weekly basis, um, just having you know more video time available so we can all you know exchange information faster than just the website or email list. Yeah, so uh, if you want to keep, keep this conversation going, um, look for our call tomorrow afternoon. Beautiful. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Happy three years, Open Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.